it is of course something that I thought about uh, and was bothering me. Of course, it was this question, so how should I behave as a leader? Today, we have a very exciting guest on Behind the O. This is the most mysterious executive of Oriflame. And why do I say this? Because this is the person who always allows other people to speak, while his story is never told. Are you ready? Have you understood whom I'm talking about? Right. Welcome, Johan Rosenberg. Senior Vice President and Head of Commercial Division. Welcome, Johan. Thank you. Looking forward to talking to you today. Me too. Can you describe in three words what you do in Oriflame? I uh, try to uh, support the markets and uh, trying to enjoy as much as possible of that moment working with my team. How many years has it been in Oriflame? It has been since the end of 1995 since I'm in Oriflame. So that becomes quite a long time. Let's go into this. Why Oriflame? You know, how did you find Oriflame or did Oriflame find you? Probably a combination. I uh, studied at the Stockholm School of Economics where Oriflame was present at the time. But also when you study there, uh, you also get the hints to go to many other cool places like uh, McKinsey, like uh, BCG and uh, all the investment banks in, in London which I did not really feel I had the heart for. So I, my first job was actually a company called ABB, Electroinvest. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were having infrastructural projects, investments in Eastern Europe. Somehow I realized fairly early there, I wrote my term paper for them, and then I continued to start working with these project financing projects. And I realized that this is uh, quite many years uh, until these investments will pay off. It's 30, 40, 50 years working with uh, states, uh, state governmental uh, places in, in uh, various countries. So I looked for something more quick, more dynamic than that. Uh, and speaking to one of my friends, uh, he tips me about, about uh, Oriflame. Oriflame at the time was then known for being quick, being fast, being a company which entered many new markets. It was in the mid 90s, so uh, of the Oriflame Eastern Europe going into market by market and you could get lots of responsibility quickly and uh, it sounded like a fun challenge, one of those companies where things could happen quite fast. Uh, at the time I was in Brussels. With ABB. With ABB and also studying French, uh, enjoying my life. And uh, I just sent in a letter to, uh, to Oriflame. And at that time, was it a paper letter or was it an email already? It was a paper letter at the time. Really? So did you get a phone call as uh, an answer or did you get a paper letter back? I got a phone call back. And then Jonas of Joknik was still active in the office and I had a final interview with him um, on a Sunday that I will never forget. I had been on a wedding the night before. Uh, we were supposed to meet in the afternoon and then suddenly the phone calls at say eight o'clock on the Sunday morning and, and I pick up the phone and it was him. Jonas. Jonas, he called me and said, can you make it here in one hour instead to the office? And I uh, just did not think about refusing. I said, yes, of course. I actually was living not far from the office, so it was 
physically possible despite the wedding night before. I put on some suit and, and went down there. Meeting Jonas, uh, he had a pullover with a, I think a hole on, on the elbow and I felt a bit stupid but, but got engaged by his power somehow, uh, his uh, interest in, in both people and the future and Oriflame and what one could accomplish. He somehow said towards the end of um, uh, the conversation, he said, think about this, I mean you will have so much more fun in, in Oriflame than in where you are today. Before we left the meeting, he said, you know, I am quite late. Uh, my uh, wife will kill me. I'll drive you home on the way, uh, but can you go down to the market there? You see outside the window and buy one kilo of tomatoes, one kilo of uh, potatoes and some cucumbers. And I'll take out the car and, and meet you up there. Did you do that? Yeah, of course I did, of course I did. <laughs> Uh, it felt fairly natural somehow. But then you, you ha having interviewed them with some of the other places, meeting some other companies, you just felt that this was a normal company with normal people. Uh, and you can be yourself. Uh, and that's what attracted me and, and still attracts me. I was sent to Latvia as an operations manager. Uh, I was supposed to be for a year and then continue to, to uh, Moscow. The logic and reasoning was that I would uh, learn from the experience of converting, because we were actually selling retail in Latvia at the time, which we also did in Ukraine and Russia, converting that retail business to direct selling and how, how would that transition uh, be and, and how would it develop. How old were you when you came to Latvia? I was 25 years old. So 25 years old as operation manager entering Latvia office of Oriflame. What, ex what waited for you there? It was of course a very big challenge, uh, but it was also the reasoning why I joined. So uh, I took, a, took it for what it was and it was uh, a lot of hard, hard work, uh, but loads of fun as well. What was the hardest thing that you did? And uh, I mean, how much work was it? Because a lot of people think that when you work, you know, as a manager or an expat, it's sort of all plated in front of you, you know, on a golden plate and uh, you come and people do everything. Uh, clearly, I had to earn my uh, position uh, and earn the trust and earn everything. I uh, started off living in some flat in, in Riga. It was uh, leakages and the toilet was broken every week. And, and uh, I was sitting in this cold tram in the mornings to the office. So clearly I remember that you had to fight for it. It was definitely not served on a plate. And how was it? Because I remember, um, uh, you know, that time, uh, 90s, that it was a lot of, uh, I don't know if it's the correct English word, deficit uh, in those uh, countries, isn't it? It was the same in the former Soviet Union and it was in the Baltics and it was in some other Eastern European countries when you couldn't get hold of a lot of products and there were massive queues. Did it affect Oriflame somehow? It heavily affected Oriflame. We came with something that was uh, truly uh, for the time, very, very interesting. It was great quality products at affordable prices. It was also the whole income opportunity of people in a society where there were not so many opportunities around. So we got well-educated people that earned quite a lot of money. And then plus the extra spark on Latvia was that people were used to the products. They had used the products in retail. They, they knew about the product, so it was not about an unknown company starting up something. People all, all wanted them, and that just created an enormous uh, start, probably the largest start ever in the history of Oriflame in such a small country. And, and we had lines and uh, several hundred meters. We had husbands waiting for their wives uh, in queues, in queues uh, coming, uh, you know, even spending the night in the, in the cars to be first in line. 
and it, it became just boom, 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 boom in the and, beginning. And you were responsible for operations, so it must have been very hard pressure on you to deliver. Absolutely. Queues, we didn't right? have enough people to take the orders. The faxes were over full. The warehouse was not big enough. Uh, we had to find new places all the time and sort out the operations, apart from the stockouts that were by the day changing. So I suppose that uh, normal in this situation to receive a lot of complaints, correct? So how did you handle it when you were so young and new? I tried my best to try to recruit new people and take decisions, quick decisions every day. And clearly we got a lot of shit uh, and so did I. I thought I would go get some eggs or, or tomatoes one day uh, uh, when the line was so, so long in the morning, in a cold winter morning. To just understand the magnitude of things, it was even someone that wrote a letter to the Swedish king about this. A Swedish company, how could they behave like this, coming to a country like that, exploiting it, etc. But I suppose that uh, you learned a lot. I learned a lot and, and like many of us, one learns quite a lot of things at work. Of course, one needs to, to uh, do some other studies uh, apart from work, but a lot of the learnings are by doing things and exploring things. Uh, then we could have probably been better in sharing various practices between countries, etc. But at least one, one got to try a lot of different things. Yeah, and you survived. And, I mean, and, and then, if I am correct, you were then responsible for other Baltic countries correctly, and then so the Baltics in general. Yeah, actually it was so that uh, the boom was just too much for the managing director, so uh, he was replaced and I uh, took over as the MD uh, just before I turned 26. That was also a challenge, but, but somehow uh, I got, gained the confidence of, of the people uh, trying to uh, sort out the situation and having an open dialogue and language with, with the staff of what was going on and what was going to happen. So uh, it turned out well and I still have very many friends from that time. What was the most difficult thing for you to do or the decision to take when you were in one of your first management positions? A yeah, managing director at the time in Lithuania. We had taken a decision for her to leave, which was very uh, tough for me being then 26 years old and, and uh, she was 45, 50 and had much more experience and uh, I remember it so much as uh, such a nervous uh, one of the first management things to do. And why did you have to let her go? Because she was not really standing by what we wanted to achieve and she had had, had the opportunity to, um, to uh, change that for quite some time. It was super scary and I so much remember that dinner when I was uh, telling her. I was so nervous for what, what, uh, what will she say, what uh, happens to me, uh, when should I say this. Finally I, I just let it out so to say. But it was very tough um, and probably because I was having the wrong sort of focus. I was more worried about about myself, how will I say it, uh, how will I be perceived, uh, or can I, you know, what, what, what will happen to me, etc, etc. But, but somehow when one concluded that, that uh, it is actually more important for her to be in the right place in life, uh, then it became much easier. It's nothing against her as a person, it's nothing against her as a professional, it's just not the right match. Uh, and then, then it felt easier. So did you have this insight during your talk with her? Uh, probably afterwards. I was so into all of this of how do you do this and, and uh, it's not like it is today when you can sit and look at various YouTube clips and, uh, or you can uh, read and understand what is the smartest to do and when and how. Um, uh, it was different and it was just learning by experience. 
Amazing. So what you are saying is that in a difficult conversation, you need to shift focus, yes, from yourself to your partner. And when you shift the focus and you give this attention, the conversation becomes normal. It's uh, very much so. And I think this, this goes throughout in many situations, uh, in, in business and in leadership and focusing on the customers. And when you sort of take away that, what do people think about yourself and, and how am I doing? Uh, it's more important to focus on what, how others are doing and how to make them uh, tick and develop. when you are young and maybe not that experienced in being a manager, but you really want to and uh, you really try hard. And then suddenly you get this position or promotion and you come to the team. Usually you inherit teams. So when you were then in Latvia, uh, young, you know, and you came to the market, you became an MD and you got the team. What did you do to earn there, yes, we will follow Johan. To me, it is very much about having an open dialogue and being open with what you expect, being open of the sort of rules of the game and being open about who you are uh, and what you can expect. Well, everybody says being all open. How do you do that? It's about everything in life. It's about giving and taking and, and uh, you need to give a bit to, to get a bit. And then you, of course, have to be a role model, uh, set examples and, and really play by that book. But I mean, you were just young. Uh, what role model? Uh, what did, did you do mistakes? You know, any sort of like something no, that I, I did probably, you cry at nights? Was probably, it scary? Nah, it was not scary. It was it was fun and it was exciting. And sometimes I speak because uh, one of my friends from that time, he was working at uh, Tetra Pak. Yeah. And sometimes we speak about those days as, as really interesting days. We were the only ones that were booking the tennis courts at 11 o'clock in the night until 1 o'clock in the morning. Those were the things that was the hype uh, all around. I uh, was based in Moscow since August 1997, we had just opened Estonia. Were you the boss of the whole uh, Russia then? No, Magnus was the big boss of Russia. So what was your position? Some sort of business development type of role, uh, focusing on operations and, and marketing. For a person who is very sort of um, prone of thinking about career, wasn't that a strange career move? When you go from being the number one in the market to some position in a regional office reporting to many, many people and sort of not having the whole responsibility? Well, for me, it was not. Uh, and, and maybe I'm just not so title uh, fixated or oriented. For me, it's the most important thing is that it's a challenging and interesting task uh, that is important for the company. And, and I, I really believe by, by doing that job and doing it well uh, with, with the team that you have, uh, the career somehow will solve itself. Then Magnus was the responsible, uh, Magnus Brandström, yes? So he was responsible for Russia, correct? Yes. And then after that, with time, you took over this responsibility and then you became the boss for Russia and then the boss for the CIA. Yeah, I think Russia was probably in 2000 I took over. At the time then Magnus still had the, the responsibility for the CIS. So I was responsible for Russia. We had someone responsible for Ukraine and then uh, the Baltics. And then also uh, Magnus became responsible for, for Asia. So the world was uh, very much divided between, uh, over time between Jesper and, and Magnus yeah. in various regions. And then in 2005, yes, Magnus uh, became a CEO and then he left Moscow. And then, so you became the big boss there, correct? Correct. Uh, I took over after him being responsible for the CS and the Baltics, mm -hmm. uh, while Thomas then took over uh, Asia at the time. 
And here comes my question, and I apologize if uh, it may sound inconvenient, but how did you feel to be the leader after Magnus? And I will explain why I am asking this. Uh, it's for me, because I work with Magnus very closely, and I work with you very closely, your antipodes. Magnus is very loud, charismatic, he is always, you know, on stage, he is a fantastic speaker, and you are more balanced, you are very intellectual, you are maybe silent in a lot of meetings, you are mostly giving other people space than being in the center of attention yourself. And then I suppose that after many years in the CIS, well, I don't know this, this is more my question to you, but I am sure that people got used to having the leader like Magnus there, you know, in the center, on the stage, and then suddenly you need to take over. Did you have thoughts about, you know, how to match that or would people like you? Um, because you're so different. And uh, for me, you have completely different leadership styles as well. It is, of course, something that I thought about and was bothering me, maybe, or... Uh, How much? A lot? Uh, not a lot, but uh, I mean, somehow I had been the uh, MD of Russia for four or five years. But mine was still was there. He was still there, absolutely, but I still felt some confidence in, in the results that we were having. But absolutely, you're right that, that uh, there were many questions, so how should I behave here and there? Even though I was quite comfortable, even if you say that it was different in many ways, uh, I uh, also know that we are uh, very similar in, in the ways that we look upon things and, and decision that we would take. So from that sense, I f was fairly confident. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, uh, it, is, it is this question, how, so how should I be? I had been, of course, on stage many times and have no major problems with it. On the other hand, it's not like I must be on stage. And the same thing with giving my view in a meeting. I, I do it uh, when I think something goes wrong, but I, I'm not the one that needs to speak all the time. So clear differences, but of course it was this question, so how should I behave as a leader? And, and I remember some time when I was, uh, it was probably some development dialogue that we had, and I was asking someone of my, uh, in my management team, so how am I doing, is it okay, or what, what's happening? This person told me that, uh, well, you're doing great. You were doing great before. And then I somehow realized that it's clearly better to be yourself and continue the path you're on with your own values and your own beliefs, be genuine and, and uh, authentic, rather than trying to be uh, a copy of someone else. So clearly better to be a good and strong Johan than a second best Magnus. But I know that you met your love in Oriflame and your wife used to work in Oriflame, correct? That is correct. So can we hear Johan's love story now? Absolutely. Uh, it's so that we uh, met in, in Oriflame, even though we didn't start to date in any shape or form. It was only a year after I think she had left Oriflame where we all of a sudden meet in, in Yekaterinburg in the same a hotel she was there for another company and uh, we decided to have dinner together and then we decided to have more dinners together <laughs> and how many years ago now uh, that is 20 years ago actually impressive and i know that at home you are totally surrounded by women correct that is also correct yes yeah, so tell us a bit about your family uh, we have, or my wife has uh, a daughter, um, but she's still in Moscow. She had her sort of uh, both education and start of professional life there and decided not to move back to Sweden with us. Then we have, uh, but she has been living with uh, us since she, or with me then, since she was 11, so I feel very much part of her imported years of, of uh, development. And then um, we have uh, two daughters more. 
13 and 17 years old at the moment. Exciting age. Very much so. So what kind of dad are you? Are you, you know, I'm allowing everything to my children, dad, or are you strict dad? If I um, ask my wife, she would say that I am allowing everything. <laughs> Somehow I can uh, believe that. <laughs> yeah, but it's not really the case. Sometimes because <laughs> no, 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 not really, not really, not when it becomes too serious. Uh, then, um, then clearly I have a strong view. They know exactly what I think about this and that. Mm. Then for me there are certain things that are more important than I go in and, and steer up their life, so to say, than, than, uh, than other things. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. But how is it to do all these girly things for you, you know? I mean, it must be a lot of uh, films together and, you know, and uh, ponies and... Uh, well, yeah, I have boys, so I am sort of missing all this and that's what was I was dreaming about. But mm. in my family, it's only football all the time now. I have probably done the other way around then from you. Uh, I play tennis with the girls and uh, they play football and they enjoy skiing like cool. I do. Uh, and this summer was probably this uh, sort of revelation that you, you see that your children are enjoying and doing the things that you have been sort of bringing them up with. Uh, we are here with uh, Johan's daughter, Maria, who uh, actually said that she would answer some questions about Johan. Maria, are you ready? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Good. Well, I have the main question. I asked Johan what kind of dad he is, and he gave us an answer. And I would like now to compare if the answer is the same that you would give us. So here is the question. What kind of dad Johan is? Yeah, he's very helpful and kind, and he's like un uh, he likes to put everybody for at first hand. So he helps us before he helps himself, and he like he really loves to be with our family. You can feel that because he's like the the one that always wants to do stuff together, uh, while we other girls want to sit in our room and watch films. <laughs> uh, He's like trying to get the family together, watch football or something else, uh, or play tennis together while we all lazy cats sit in our room. <laughs> That's quite funny. But you know what? I know him only at work, of course. And at work, he is, uh, well, he looks like a very kind person. And he is always very happy, you know, he is sort of calm and he's always positive. Mm -hmm. Is he like this in real life at home? Yeah. Can he ever be angry with you? Sometimes, <laughs> like, uh, but not, it's very rarely. Uh, he likes to be like happy and positive, of course. Uh, that's his personality. And uh, yeah, he's very calm and like chill sometimes. He's like very relaxed. If I ask you, has he ever been strict with you? Has he ever forbid you anything? Uh, yeah, well, sometimes. Uh, I don't actually have an example, but I know that he have been like a bit strict uh, if we have done something wrong or yeah, but he's very like he knows the rules and he knows his game like uh, it's not like something that shouldn't be wrong because it was wrong what we did if we did so. Uh, and you respect that? Yeah. I yeah. Look Maria, I have the last question to you. If you would wish something to your dad, what would that wish be? I wish that, uh, that he has a, still have a great life with lots of sport and that he gets all his wishes that he wants to do and like everything he wants he can get and that he can decide himself what's best for him. Thank you so much. Amazing meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. How is it for you with work-life balance? Do you have any work-life balance in your life? Good question. I uh, probably could have more of work-life balance. Of course, in this situation, we, we have some sort of support at home with some of the duties, uh, but we are trying to... Uh, I'm not relying on my wife doing all the dinners and uh, 
uh, cleaning all the floors and uh, doing all the laundry, etc., etc. We try to help each other as much as uh, we can. Uh, forcing the children is clearly tougher than, than dividing among ourselves. And then, then we have some, some support uh, in that area. But, so, uh, so what are your duties? I am uh, definitely cooking some dinners and I am definitely uh, doing some of the boring stuff. <laughs> What's uh, that? <laughs> Taking out the, the from the dishwasher and and uh, uh, also the laundry um, ironing. I'm not the best at, but uh, I can do it. I just don't like it. But we have support. Uh, then, of course, there are certain things that uh, that uh, are clearly on my side, and that's all the other technicalities like mowing the lawn and and uh, fixing the the el electrical stuff and uh, various computer and, and phone equipment and uh, uh, that the lamps are functioning outside etc 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 and are you enjoying do doing those things because i mean you you did um call some things boring but in general when you need to do all those household chores what are you thinking about is it like oh just just do it and no, no, let I, it go or I are you enjoying no, something? No, but I have no problem uh, doing them and I am probably using them as some sort of uh, getting away from, from work thing. Mm -hmm. I can listen to some pod, I can uh, uh, look at some film or, or series, TV series or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, uh, the only thing is that those things one would like to do when one wants to do them not only when they need to be done that's well said absolutely <laughs> i agree what are you reading at the moment uh, any books you can recommend i have just reread some books the 80 20 principle okay. i have re i have just recently reread mm -hmm. very much so because i felt that it's uh, in these times, even more important to focus on the things that give output, so to say, and, and lead to results. Um, usually I, I am not the best at sort of be strict on prioritizing uh, because when I see something wrong or see something that can be better, I, I very much become allergic to it and just want it sorted. So from that sense, it helps me to, to really understand that it actually gives you much more if you prioritize correctly. Johan, you give an impression of a person who just loves spending time on your own with like a lot of books and magazines. I can see you reading, I don't know, McKinsey reports or Harvard Business Review and so that no people around you and nobody touches you. Am I correct? Not really. I managed to not read, definitely not all of that. I would like to read much more, but it's just uh, not the time, but on the contrary, I'm, I'm, um, I hate being alone. Really? Ever since uh, a child, I, I always loved those big family gatherings. And, and when we were going on holiday, I always uh, wanted two or three other families to go with us and, and do things together. So you like partying? I enjoy <laughs> actually definitely being um, out, no doubt. So less and less time for it, but I, I, uh, we were out just a couple of days ago with a friend of mine turned 50 and, and we gathered 20, 30 actually old friends and, and doing some bars here in Stockholm. <laughs> nice. And what about when you're alone? Uh, if you love people so much, what do you actually do when you're on your own with your own thoughts? I am hardly alone because I, uh, as soon as someone the last person leaves the house, then I get I start something for five minutes, but then I get so bored, and then I start calling my uh, my friends or or calling my family. When you come after the busy day at work, or when you used to travel a lot, and you come home, how do you relax? Where do you leave your stress, and how do you use your time at home so that your life become balanced? For me, it's very much about family and it's about uh, sports. So, uh, I mean, in this area, it's so easy. You just go out for a walk, power walk or 
out running. There are some tennis courts not far from here as well. Uh, but maybe most of all I enjoy being with the family, helping the kids with the homework, doing these luxury everyday activities that I have not done for a long time mm -hmm. and really focusing on that. Uh, homework, activities, taking to from football games. I just love it standing there speaking with other parents and, and uh, watch the game. But then I have a question because you were traveling so much previously and in all your jobs that you described, I mean, you were really a person out there in the field working. And now suddenly you're based in Stockholm and then it's a COVID situation, so there is no travel. Isn't it that uh, now it's too much of you here at home? How are you handling that? That's a very good question. You probably better ask my family members. Mm -hmm. I re really much enjoy it. And, and actually to that question the other day, uh, my wife uh, said to me that, well, how nice it is uh, that you're home. I was afraid that it would not work, but it w I love you more than ever or something <laughs> like that. Nice. Well, thank you for sharing this. How do you basically deal with yourself so that you still have energy to do something actively after you come back from work? I uh, very much relate back to the feeling when you're actually doing it. I mean, I love running for a ball. I love focusing on winning, hating to lose. And that feeling plus also I know that afterwards when you have done it you always feel so good. So I try to mentally uh, already be there and that helps me to actually go out and do it. Okay, so what's Johan's life hack? You come back home, how do you do it? So how fast should you go and sort of swap and do the, uh, you know, do the sports activities before the routine eats you up? I try to do it immediately. Immediately, yeah. so the back down, sports clothes yeah. on and go out. Yeah. yeah. So guys, now we know what to do. I have no excuses. So what kind of the leader are you? Very empowering, I believe. I am uh, open, I'm quite positive. I believe in, in people and believe that the experts uh, know the best, so to say. I also believe that, that people need different things. Uh, some lead more of day-to-day -day coaching, uh, while others more want to be left alone, so to say. That's probably who I am in short. I have, I have an attention to details. Maybe some people can think that I'm uh, too soft or too nice, but, but when it really matters, uh, I think the ones working with me understand that I am coming back, I am remembering things and, and I am following up on, on things, driving things forward. The most important thing for me is that, that, uh, that we deliver results and that we deliver results by, by people uh, developing and, and delivering. And that they will only do by uh, them having the motivation, drive and, and freedom to do it their way, especially in our culture. So you rely quite a lot on the experts, you rely quite a lot on your uh, management team, on your people, and it means that they basically go and you support them, correct? Haven't you been in the situations when, um, when you give it a go to the person and then suddenly you see that the person is moving in a completely different direction? So what, what do you do? Do you sort of keep encouraging and hope that the person will change the direction eventually or will you just go in and correct? I will uh, definitely have a talk with the person and try to understand a bit more uh, the reasoning why we're going there and what we're doing. And I would clearly give my view on that. Uh, and if I don't agree, I will definitely tell uh, that person that, uh, that let's try to do it this way. But that's not very empowering for some, or? Uh, it depends on what they realize and not realize. Most people end the way at that level realize uh, because with some sort of questions around it. Have, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Challenging certain aspects. Slowly but surely uh, people usually realize that there is something into it. I believe in this empowerment in, in terms of people getting development uh, but I also 
know that I'm the one who is responsible for uh, my department, for the results, for what we're achieving. So clearly I am um, uh, stepping in there into trying to ensure the results. What do you think about, you know, raising other leaders? How many mistakes are people allowed to do? Very good question. Clearly one is allowed to make mistakes. Uh, the same mistake, not too many times, but uh, clearly one, one learns by mistake. And that's probably the most important thing, that one sees that the person uh, cares, that the person understands, and that the person takes corrective actions to, uh, to, for it not to happen again. Have you made any epic mistakes during your career? I probably have made many mistakes, um, especially probably which is one of the toughest tasks uh, uh, in, in our film, to get the leaders to work in the right direction and not to paint yourself into a corner where you just say no to things without, without maybe fully thinking it through. And those are probably uh, some of the mistakes that I have done and, and learned uh, quite a lot from as well. And how do you operate in your professional environment? Do you have support? You know, do you have somebody you can exchange thoughts? Uh, do you go to different external networks? So who supports Johan? You know, because you have very important jobs and uh, you have had very many important jobs since uh, quite some time ago. Uh, it's not always you can come to your manager and speak about it. It's not always you can come to your downline and speak about everything. What kind of support, if any, uh, have you got or are getting over time? It's a combination of uh, friends uh, that one can rely on. It's a combination of also some uh, peers uh, in the company, not necessarily in the own department, or rather, definitely not in the own department, that you that you can speak to. Do you believe that uh, a person in an executive position needs to have somebody to talk to and to clear his or her head? I believe it is good to have someone to talk to. It doesn't mean that one is to go external for everything, but at least someone to seek advice for, because. Uh, uh, you become quite alone in a managerial position uh, and you're expected to have answers to everything. Uh, and sometimes a piece of advice is important and we very often become quite siloed. Uh, could be in a country, could be in a region, could be in a function globally. Uh, and it's very, uh, very often so that it's you and your department that are supposed to know and supposed to do something. But it's good to get a different angle on things. It gets yourself going as well in terms of creative solutions. Right, uh, it was a fantastic conversation with Johan, but now time comes to summarize. Johan, over to you now. What would you like us all to remember from our discussion? Well, what has worked for me at least is um, that you, in order to lead, in order to develop, in order to become successful, you need to focus on others. Uh, somehow, if you focus on yourself, you will be completely overwhelmed with that. But by focusing on others, others will develop, others will be led, uh, others will be managed, and uh, the company will receive its results. Uh, it is a different thing that when you sort of portray uh, the person, when you portray uh, the genuine need of something and development, then that will come. So really advice, focus on other people, focus on the company strategy, the delivery of that, and the rest will come. Yourself will come, your career will come, and you will become successful. So just be yourself? Be yourself. It has to work for you. You are the one that has to feel comfortable. Uh, I very much during some time was uh, wanting to achieve this, wanting to achieve that, 
to some sort of proof for I don't know who. But when you get this knowledge and feeling that, yeah, I can do it, I will be able to achieve it, but uh, why do it? I can do 10 million other things that's much more fun in life and gives me more. It's very important to get that uh, revelation. It uh, really develops you as a person as well. Thank you very much, Johan. Thank you for the insights and what I've learned from today and that what you taught me is put another person first and then everything else will work. Thank you, Johan. Thank you. Fantastic. Bye. Bye.